ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له الواحد القهار العزيز الغفار واشهد ان سيدنا محمد عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه واله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدى هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we beseech him to send his peace and blessings upon our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam upon all of the prophets who preceded him al-anbiya ikhwa wa deenuhum wahid as the prophet said the prophets were brothers and their faith was one and upon their families and those who followed them in the truth until the end of time before we start if I could ask uh, all of the, mashallah, Nord out brothers to move forward. Mashallah, I'm the lucky one. I get to see all the Nord in the faces of the Salihin. Alhamdulillah. Jidikum Nooran, inshallah. Tamshuna bihi fi hadihi dunya wal akhirah. May Allah increase you in light, inshallah, that will serve you in this life and the next. Fitna, trials, tribulations. You know, it's one of the most difficult words to define in theology is the word fitna. When I was in Egypt studying, you know, especially in the books of fiqh, illa an yakhaf al fitna. You know, they'll mention um, a ruling and then they'll say, unless there's a fear of fitna. So I went and asked a number of professors, you know, what's fitna? And I had one professor, Sheikh Shalabi. He said to me, Al fitna di fitna. So I said, Like, what is fitna? How do you define fitna? He said, Fitna is fitna. It's not much of a definition. So we continued, me and a fellow student, uh, Imam Jamal, Jamal Diwan, who's in, in California. We had this discussion, you know, what is fitna? And I continued to read, 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 ibtilaat, istikhbarat, and so on and so forth. But the strongest definition of fitna is anything that threatens the spiritual livelihood of a person or the physical livelihood of a person. And the physical livelihood is being conditioned on the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لا طاعة المخلوق في معصية الخالق As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there is no obedience to the creation if it causes us to disobey the creator. So anything that will challenge us in our Faith, it threatens our faith or the, the faith of those around us. It threatens our ability to learn and increase our intellect. Threatens our families, threatens our livelihood, threatens our honor. This is fitna. Some ulama said, "Kullu ma yubilu shaks an Allah." Anything that distances someone from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is fitna. And these days, people are asking Asharat al-Sa'a and so on and so forth. How do we stay peaceful? And we'll talk about what that means momentarily. In times of perceived fitna and per times, in times of difficulty. There are two ways to approach this. So the first khutbah will talk about the theoretical way. The responsibility of scholars and imams and du'at to lead the people, to give them irshad. 
not to terrorize the people as Fir'aun فَاسْتَخَفَّ قَوْمَهُ فَأَطَاعُوهُ إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَوْمًا فَاسِقِينَ As is mentioned in Surah Zuhruf, the 43rd chapter, the quality of Fir'aun istikhaf is to terrorize people into doing things. But the job of the A'imma and the shuk and the scholars and the activists and the tulayyib like myself is to guide the people, to lead them to hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by clinging to the sunnah of Sayyid al-Awwani wa al And that happens usually when someone first is not trained in how to make istidlal, as we talked about yesterday in our class in Usul al-Fiqh every Tuesday and Thursday here at 8 p.m. We teach two books, Al-Aj Rumiyah and a book in Usul al-Fiqh, alhamdulillah. The ability to understand how to use evidences, not just to go and grab a book of hadith or a book of fiqh or read a fatwa online, but to know the dawabit, the principles needed when using evidences. And the, the fear that we see now is that the ummah in general has become so ignorant of this process that someone who knows how to do it will be perceived as wrong. Because they'll be more careful in their wording, more cautious in their speaking. As Imam Malik radiallahu anhu, when someone came all the way from the Maghrib to him and asked him for fatwa, and he said, I don't know. I don't know the answer. And that man, he said to Malik, Ajit min al-Maghrib. No, I came from Morocco. In those days, there was no bus, train, car. So that was a long journey. And presumably, the man came for hajj. So after hajj, he went to visit Medina Sayyid al awwalin wal Akhirin, and he met Imam Malik and he asked him this question. And Imam Malik, he said, I don't know. Subhanallah. Come Malik and Al An ala internet. How many people are like Malik now on the internet? Everybody knows. You could say, Have a nice day, and someone on Facebook will say, Well, you know, nice is a social construct rooted in, uh, you know, Anglo Saxon language. And everyone has something to say now. But very few people say, Allahu Alam. In fact, one time I went on a Muslim forum in Arabic and English, and I searched, I think, I know. SubhanAllah, an infinite number of responses. I searched, God knows, Allah knows, and Allahu Alam. I got less than 10 search results. And the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Kalimat la adri. As the ulama say, to say, I don't know is half of knowledge. In a hadith read by Abu Dawud, the Prophet said, Al -ilmu thalatha, Knowledge is three. And one of the things he said, La adri, is to say, I don't know. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So unfortunately, people are in a rush. They're moved by the environment. Situations move the hearts. And they answer quickly. But look at Malik. The man, he tries to, you know, implore him. I came from Morocco. Come on, you can't say that you don't know. So Malik, he said, give me one night to think about it. Just give me one night. This is the Imam of the Ummah and his time. The Imam of Dar Hijra and his time. La yufta wa Malik eh? Bil Medina. Nobody can speak and Imam Malik is in Medina. Radiallahu anhu. Imam al-Shafi said, amongst the ulama, Malik is a star. Radiallahu anhu. So Imam Malik, the guy, he comes the next day. Do you remember me? I came from Morocco. I have this question. I came from far away. Imam Malik said, Naam. I have your answer. La adri. My answer is, I don't know. He said, Anta imam al-dar al-hijra. Anta imam al-ummah. Wa mada sayaqulu nas. Inna ma ukhbiruhum anna malik yaqul la adri. He said, you are the imam of the ummah. What are the people of Morocco going to say when I say to them, you said you don't know? He said, قُلْ لَهُمْ مَالِكْ يَقُولْ لَا أَدْرِي Say to them, Malik said, I don't know. Then he said to him, يَا مَالِكْ هَذَا شَيْءٌ خَفِيفٌ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ This is a little issue. This is a small issue. فَبَكَى مَالِكْ Malik started crying. He said, there's nothing small in the deen. And he started crying. And he said, didn't you hear what Allah said? That Allah said to his prophet, we sent to you a heavy speech. Where is this adab now with the knowledge 
Where is this ihtiram to the ilm? And that's why unfortunately we say Maidan al-ilm fi hadhi al-ayam became the Maidan of al-hawa wa shahwat That knowledge nowadays became the place of desires. People read, they think they know, they think they understand, and everyone became a scholar. So we'll take three points, really I think that are important, that I've seen people misuse constantly to create a sense of yes in the ummah, to create a sense of despair. For some reason people think if you cause people to despair, you can motivate them. But the Prophet wasallam. and when I asked, actually I was sitting with a brother, and one day he, I said to him, you know, you are scaring people to death. There needs to be tarheeb, sah. Imam al-Ghazali said, you should scare people to the point at least to activism. But if you scare them to the point that there's no activism, this is wrong, it's not allowed. So the brother, he said to me, Suhaib, don't you know the hadith of the Prophet Tirmidhi? If you knew what I knew, you would laugh a little and cry much. I said, yeah, but the riwayah that you just quoted to me is the riwayah naqisa, is the riwayah which is not complete. And that's the riwayah mentioned by An-Nawi in Riyadh al-Salihin. Because Imam An-Nawi, he used to rely on Targhib al tarheeb it's a long story. I said to him, but go to the whole riwayah. Here's the usul, usul of fiqh. Is it allowed to mention a hadith without mentioning its entire wording, if the entire wording affects the hukum? La yajuz. It's not allowed. So I said to him, kemmel, kemmel riwayah hadihi. He said, ah, I said to him, complete the riwayah. As I heard it from my shaykh, he said to me, I don't know it. I said, if you don't know it, then you shouldn't use it. Because the riwayah continues. That after the Prophet ﷺ left his companions and they were crying, Sayyidina Jibreel, he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered me to tell you to go back to them and not leave them in that state. Do not leave them in a state of despair, Ya Muhammad ﷺ. Rasulullah he went to his companions and he gave them good tidings and he, you know, he, he helped them, he tranquilized them, sallallahu alayhi wa He calmed them down. That's the whole riwayah. So people who use certain narrations wrong to intimidate and terrify the ummah, I asked them, wallahi, especially the du'at and the activists, be very careful because the ummah of the Prophet ka'atfal in the ulama. You know, one of my he used to say, the ummah is like my son and my daughter. They have the rights on me that the rights of my children have on me. And that's in the Quran. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the scholars of the kufar. That's why in the Quran, Al Asfahani said, when they, they, they say, we found our fathers, actually it's we found our scholars. Because the relationship of the scholars to the people they lead is that of a father and his children. And what are the rights of children on a father? And it's a profound understanding. And that's why, unfortunately, religious leadership should not force the ummah to be their servants. But in acts, we should find them and scholars and activists, the servants of the ummah. Hafidhullah wa rahimullah as Shaykh Ahmad Taharian, Shaykhi. One of my teachers was the Imam of the Malikis in Cairo. And when we would go to his lesson, we would be reading the Khalil, Mukhtasa Khalil, Sharh Kabir of the Suqi. And I remember people would bring tea. And I asked him, Who paid for this tea? And he said, Ya Ibni Ana Abuk. He used to say, My son, I'm your father, drink the tea. Hafidhullah. And once I remember, the Bawab didn't serve the tea. The Sheikh, he closed his book and he served us tea. And people said to him, don't serve us, don't serve us. He said, I am to you like your father and you came from far away. That's the adab of the ulama and the salihin. And I remember I only heard Sheikh Ahmed Taharayan in t seven years of being with him make five fatwa. Five fatwa. Some people, they make five fatwa in one hour. <laughs> And if you ask them, where do you study? I go to RCC, 
I go to Harvard, I go to MIT, I go to Northeastern. Are you a specialist in Sharia? No, but you know, I read this ism and that ism and this ism and that ism. Isms that erase Sharia are nihilism. You have nothing left. So let's talk about three evidences quickly, inshallah, we'll move on. The first is the hadith of Sayyidina Anas. Any time I hear the name of Anas, I feel so happy in my heart. Because the Prophet used to love him. He used to call him Unais. You know, Unais Tasghir. It's like Puki or Lili in English. You know, the Prophet used to say to him, Unais, not Anas. He used to call him by nicknames because he loved him. And his mother, sisters, his mother was an incredible single mother. We should do a khutbah on single mothers in the ummah. She was one of the greatest single mothers in history who did not let everything against her at a societal level hold her down. Like Betty Shabazz, she rose above everything in front of her and became Umm Sulaim radiallahu anha who brought Anas to the Prophet and said, I have no money to give, I give my son. And Anas ibn Malik said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, as related by Sayyidina al-Bukhari radiallahu anhu, and Imam Bukhari also was the son of a single mother raised by a woman, was al-Bukhari. And at 16, he said, Mom, can I move to Mecca and study hadith? Think about where Al-Bukhari lived in Bukhara. That's a long trip. And look at her love for him. She said, yes, if I can go with you and drop you off. So she took him to school and left him in Mecca. Radiallahu anhu. He said that the Prophet sallallahu said, no day will come to you except it's worse than the day before it. And no day will come to you except it's worse than the day that came before it. This hadith is sahih. Rawahu al-Bukhari in his sahih al-jami'ah. But the how people use it is the problem. Because we understand that an evidence has a number of adab. There are three adab to any dalil. Number one, ma'rifatu, is to know it. But number two, kayf istifarat minha, how to use it. As al-Baydawi mentioned, and this is the problem we see. People have adilla. They don't know how to use them properly. They don't know how to use them properly. And I mentioned one time in this masjid, a brother came into my office drunk. And I said to him, Subhanallah, you're drunk. He said, I'm not praying, no. I said, what? He said, La taqrabu salatu antum sukara. Don't pray when you're drunk. I said, Ya Mawlana, this is not the place for mafum mukhalifa. And you're not Hanafi. Here's the evidence. He used an evidence. But he's using it wrong, in the wrong way. So you should ask people when they bring evidences to you, have you studied kayfiyat istifadati minha? Have you studied the 33 or 34 etiquettes used for dalil? Mentioned by Imam al-Haramain. If they say no, say, هذا فراق بيني وبينك. Be like Qadr with Musa. It's time to dip. So people will take this hadith of Sayyidina Anas. There is not a day except the day after it for you will be worse. There's not a day except the day after it for you, kum, will be worse. And they say, see, this is a proof that the ummah since that day will consistently be experiencing days which are worse. This hadith actually is declared mushkil by the ulama. It means a hadith which its dalala is mushkila. Like what it means is a problem. How do we interpret it? And there were a lot of attention given to the ulama by it. The Hafiz ibn Abdul Bar radiallahu anhu. He mentions in a tamheed or istifkar, as is mentioned by Imam Ibn Hajar Fatul al-Bari, that kum here is the sahaba, it's not the ummah. You is not all of us. You is only the companions of the Prophet sallallahu And this was the opinion of Abdullah bin Mas'ud because he said, a short time later, the Prophet sallallahu the greatest musibah of this ummah is that the Prophet died sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, every day after that for us, each second, each minute, each hour, each day, each month, each year that we failed to be with him was worse than those days that we were with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it makes sense. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ Allah said, I will not punish them and you are with them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Sayyidina Abdul Masood said, this is talking to us as sahabi because one second of not seeing his face Physically is worse. Every moment away from him for us is worse. And that's why Al-Hafidh ibn Hazm, he said, radiallahu anhu, that one second of the life of the Sahabi physically with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is better than your entire life in this world. That's the meaning of 
from the hadith. The second is the taqseem of Dar Islam and Dar Harb. We find people saying, especially for those of you who came to America recently, or your children are still struggling to create an identity for themselves in America. We see that they will constantly invoke the idea that, you know, you sold out, you gave up on your homeland, you moved to America, the land of milk and honey. I don't think they understand it's the land of wick and food stamps. It's not the land of milk and honey for many of us. And gentrification and structural injustices in Ferguson, Missouri, and the largest number of homeless people in this country are children, far from being the land of milk and honey. There's a little milk and a little honey, but it's more like half and half, and some honey you got at Costco. But that will be used against you. And then they will say, hey, How can you live in the land of war? Did you ever think to ask people, did the Prophet Sallallahu ever use this land of war, land of Islam, land of Dara Islam, Dara Harb? Where'd you get this stuff from? So if we go historically, there are no hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu there are no statements of the Khulafa or the Salaf that use this taqseem, Dara Islam and Dara Harb. There's one narration related on behalf of the Prophet Sallallahu which is Mawdu'a. Remember this word because Mawdu'a means a hadith which is fabricated and according to our scholars it is not allowed even to quote it unless you're with the ulama and that's why Ibn Jawzi wrote a book called Mawdu'at although there are some mistakes in that book some of the hadith are sahiha but rahimahullah everybody makes mistakes but the, the hadith which is attributed to our beloved Prophet that says he used the word Dar Harb is Mawdu'a fabricated without any doubt amongst the scholars so where did it start? It started in the time of Harun Rashid. Harun Rashid went to Shaybani, the student of Abi Hanifa, radiallahu anhum jami'an, and he asked him, Sif lana ayyamana, describe for us these days of ours. He said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, Daruhum, Daru Harbu, Daruna, Daru Islam. This is where it started. He said, Our land is a land of Islam, their land is a land of war. Sixty years later or so, or less, a Shafi'i who died 204 Hijri, he comes and he changes this. He said, no, this is not complete. It's not jami'. it's mani, it's not jami'. He said, we should add to it the land of war, the land of Islam, and the land of treaties. After him came a Shashi, radiallahu anhu, al-Hanafi, the great scholar of Usul, Usul al-Shashi. And he said very beautifully, actually, this is a number of years later, he said, this is incorrect. The, 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 the more Quranic, Outlook of the world is Daru Dawa, the lands which have not accepted Islam, places of Dawa, and the lands where people have believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After him came Al Maurudi and his book Sultan al Hukuma, Al Hakim, he has this adab of the, 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 the Sultaniyah. And he talks in there very interestingly enough and said, Darul Islam, the land of Islam is anywhere you can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and avoid haram. And he based this on the hadith of Fudayk who came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Kama Imam Ahmed, he said it in Sahih. He came to the Prophet, he was from Yemen. He said, I live with people who are not Muslims. At that time, Al-Yemen was Christian. Should I make hijrah? And this is the time hijrah was an obligation. Should I make hijrah to you, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Ish ma'aqawmik. He said to him, call to good, forbid the evil, establish the prayer. Call to good, forbid evil, stay away from the forbidden, and live with your people. Aish is fi'l amr yufidu wujub. You must live with your people. For that reason, Al Haythami, Al Shafi, and Fatwa Al Kubra, he mentions the strong opinion of the Shafi method of most of our Somali brothers, Alhamdulillah, Al Shufa'a bi Fadillah. That the strong and dominant opinion, Mu'tamad bi Madhab al Shafi, is that for a person who lives in the lands of non Muslims and can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala freely, and avoid the haram. And the reality is we can worship Allah freely here more than most Muslim countries. Lil Asif Shadid. I remember once when I first went to a Muslim country, I say this with respect, I didn't know, I went to Fajr. You know, I walked to Fajr, there were two people in Fajr. When I got home, this, the guy that was next to me was waiting for me in front of my apartment. And he said, I need to talk to you, where are you from? Can I see your passport? I said, bro, we just prayed Fajr. And he, said, he started laughing. He said, obviously, you don't know. People don't pray Fajr here. Not in Muslims. I was like, but we're in a Muslim country. He's like, what's your name? Do you belong to a group? Who's your sheikh? 
And I was like, no, my name's William. When I said my name is William, he ran away from me, alhamdulillah. I showed him that blue passport, mashallah. But that was before 9-11. After 9-11, the blue passport will get you in trouble. Practice your faith and bring people like me, people like me. If one of you hadn't had enough guts to speak to me, I would not be here today speaking to you. If a Muslim had not set an example for me, I would never have been Muslim. So the power that the chef Imeth had talks about, and that's what Haythami said, he will accomplish the greatest, she will accomplish the greatest objective is to bring hearts and touch hearts and bring them to faith. The last hadith is the hadith of Ruyat Sud, the hadith of black flags. Now with ISIS, but in their videos that they have produced and they have put their name on and they have publicly said are their videos, we are seeing things that no Muslim should have an ethic, ethical dilemma in denouncing. There's no loyalty to evil, regardless of its name or background. And some will say, well, what about Gaza? How many khutb we gave here, we denounce what's happened in Gaza? I will never ever be silent about the humanitarian disaster that's happening in Palestine. Never, ever. No one can silence me on this issue, inshallah. Just as we see what's happening in Missouri and other places, we have to be consistent in our condemnation of evil, oppression, death, and murder. Regardless, but Nuaim Ibn Hamad, he wrote a book called Kitab al-Fitna. This book is a book which is filled with some of the most preposterous narrations. And I remember in 1999 at a conference, I ran into Anwar Awlaqi. And I saw him and he told me, Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. And he told me, I'm reading this book called Kitab al Fitna. This book. And I believe, I never saw him after that. Or maybe once. I believe after that, this is the book when I look at his writings and look at what he said, it's filled with the riwayat of this book. Riwayat which are considered fabricated for the most part. This narration, the Prophet said, "Ida sauda or sud, excuse me. If you see the black flags from the east, azimu ardakum, sit, don't move." Many people are taking this narration and saying, "This is ISIS." The problem here is that this narration, as agreed upon by the scholars of Hadith, is absolutely fabricated. It has no sound source whatsoever. And the rule for these type of narrations is they should not be used. But I guarantee you when you go home tonight, go on any forum, Facebook, anywhere, someone is going to quote this narration. Is a fabrication. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yuthabbitna ala al-haqq. Kama nas'aluhu subhanahu wa ta'ala yukrimna bi hadratihi subhanahu wa ta'ala fi dunya wal akhirah. كما نسأله سبحانه وتعالى يجعلنا من الذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أقول قول هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam he gave us a very simple thing we can all do as we finish the khutbah and that is the Prophet ﷺ said, اتَّقِ اللَّهَ حَيْثُ مَا كُنْتْ This is one of the last things he said to Sayyidina Mu'adh. As related by Mu'atta in, in, in Imam Malik and the Mu'atta, even though it's Mursal, it's connected in other narrations. The last thing he said to Sayyidina Mu'adh was, Fear Allah wherever you are. The Muslim community has had its collective conscience constantly turn to things which are far away from our own realities here. That doesn't mean that we don't have concern for them. And that doesn't mean that we don't work for change. 
But at the same time, if we ignore our backyard, we ignore our own homes, we are going to wake up to a problem. Young Muslims are leaving Islam in America. It's a phenomenon. They're not leaving Islam because of theology. And they're not leaving Islam for some, usually, as I just said, religious related issue. They're leaving Islam because they feel the community is apathetic to them. They do not have a place in the community. When I moved to this community, I remember I was walking down the street. I ran into a young brother. He had a, a Tom Brady jersey or something on. And I sa he said to me, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. He said, Wa alaikum wa salamu wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. fi'an, alhamdulillah. We started talking, young Somali brother. And I said to him, you know, I never see you in the masjid. He said, well, one uncle ran me out of the masjid. I said, why? He said, I wore a football jersey to the masjid. He told me it's haram to wear a football jersey in the masjid. That's how we're losing people. We're losing them because we appear as apathetic to their needs, but we're hypercritical of things we don't agree with. And we have to change that. That's part of ittaqillah. To focus on our own institutions, our own communities. And we see here with Quran Institute under the leadership Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنَ الشَّيْطَانِ Indeed, the people of taqwa, if shaitan comes to them, they get confused. مَسَّهُمْ And he confuses them. They remember Allah. فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبَصِرُونَ And then they have insight. So repentance and the obedience of Allah is a way to bring basira. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, بَصَّرَنَا إِنشَاءَ The second is that in the most difficult times, stay with Allah. Cling to Allah. In the 8th chapter of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِذَا لَقِيتُمْ فِئَةً فَثْبُتُوا وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا لَعَلَكُمْ تُفْلِحُمْ In the times of jihad, in the physical battle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Sahaba, stay strong and remember Allah. Remember Him in this ma'raka. The last is prioritize your families and yourself. Prioritize yourself and your families. One of the great scholars that I studied with, one time I asked him, he passed away, rahimahullah, and I asked him, what is the one thing you regret? And he said, I served the ummah, and I forgot to serve my children. Subhanallah. Sometimes we get caught up with passion and emotion, but we forget to look after our own. So make sure, schedule every week some time to be with your kids. My children in Malaysia, I try to schedule with them at least some time every week to Skype or FaceTime. It's hard. I have the same challenges you have. The same challenges you have. It's difficult, but the commitment should be there. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yazidna imanina. Kama nasalu subhanahu wa ta'ala yahfadhana min al-fitim. Nasaluhu subhanahu wa ta'ala yuslih bar hadihi al-umma al-washarrafa. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify the affairs of this beautiful ummah. An ummah that the Prophet ﷺ had a tremendous love for. ﷺ. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide the imams, the activists, the leaders of our community. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect them, to make them strong. We ask Allah to bless the mothers of this community, single or otherwise, in the raising of their children and the struggles they face. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen you and give you insight and wisdom. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the people of Palestine. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make them strong and to grant them insha'Allah the strength needed for the future. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the people of Syria. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put them in his himaya al-muqaddasa. Ask him to put, him in, in, uh, put them under his sacred protection. The brothers and sisters of, in Africa, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them from Ebola. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring a quick cure to this devastating disease. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us conquer the fitan of our hearts. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to distance us from anything that will displease Him. We ask Allah to protect those of our community who are addicted to alcohol and drugs. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replace the love of being drunk with those things, with the drunkenness of iman. The love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
and the shawq for the ta'a of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah to bless the people of the Khalij, the students who came here from the Gulf countries, their families and their communities. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ikrimkum sha'Allah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all humanity, those who are oppressed, whether it's the family of Michael Brown, the people of Ferguson, Missouri, or otherwise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lift oppression from the people and replace it with justice. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wassalamun ala al-mursaleen walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.